Have you heard of the, that, the plant called Shanka Piedra? Nope. So Shanka Piedra means stone breaker. That's mm. what Shanka Piedra means. It's a plant, its Latin name is Philentus neruri, and it's been used for centuries in South America to eliminate kidney stone. How does a healer 400 years ago know that that plant breaks kidney stone yeah. when they have never seen a kidney and they've probably never seen a kidney stone, but they call that plant kidney stone, mm. a, a stone breaker. And when you ask them, I was in South America in the jungle and I asked them, how do you know that this plant breaks kidney stones? And they say, the plant told me. Yeah, same with ayahuasca. Yeah. And the sugar plant. Exactly. Yeah. They take ayahuasca and then they speak to the plant and the plant told them that that, ki that breaks kidney stone. Every scientist will tell you, this is ridiculous, folks medicine, it's worthless. Yeah. Until they did a study on 20 people and they saw that all the kidney stone fractures into millions of pieces and you pass them without any pain. Mm. So now a century, not a century, a thousand years of use of that plant suddenly got uh, made credible and, and accepted because of a double blind study in those 20 people. Mm. For me, ancestral knowledge on thousands of people, tens of thousands of people for centuries is so much more valuable than a study. So, so when I look in, in, in from that context, I don't put a whole lot, I mean, I'm a scientist. I, I, I look at things from a scientific standpoint because it needs to be developed, it needs to be proven and all of that. But for me, it's all a matter of experience. Mm. What is your experience with it? If it's true for you, then do it, it works for you. And, uh, but, but then your other question was when we cross that line and we get into the, the metaphysics, um, for me, my drive into everything that I'm doing right now in this world of stem cells, it's not because I'm fascinated by stem cells. I'm fascinated by what they can do. I have seen so many pet people getting benefits, but at the end of the day, I mean, if, even if your stem cells are immortal and you live up to 150, 100 years old, if you don't, realize why you're here, then you've wasted 108 years of fi figuring out why you're here. Mm. And so my best way to summarize it would be to say, the moment we start to really dig into like something like near-death experience, your body is, is dead, declared dead, your brain has flatline. So a brain that is flatline doesn't do a whole lot of thinking, but you go somewhere where you experience a level of thinking that is so much more deeper, so much more wholesome, so much more, you see yourself under a light where worries are gone. You come back and you remember that you had like such a deep insight on your own life and your own existence. And you come back with that deep insight. You had this when your brain was flatlined. So there's a part of you, it, that part did not, was not born when you died. Mm. It's not your flatlined brain that suddenly created something superior to you. So that means that, that you, is there right now. Mm. And the only reason why we don't experience it, it's because we give priority to the thinking brain yep. that has ideas about everything. And it covers your true essence with all these ideas about things. So for me, the quest is to find who are we and let's silence the mind to discover who is the real us. So in other words, let's die before the body dies and, this, and live in this body by fully identifying with that that, that is true in us. So for me, all this work with stem cells is, is giving us more longevity to have more time to really dive into that quest. Because unfortunately, um, in our 50s, 60s, people develop health issues. And when they do, then their entire life gets consumed by, di by this health problem. Mm. You have diabetes now, you do all kinds of things to remove diabetes. I mean, you completely lost the quest for you, who you truly are. So for me, that's, that's the leverage that stem cells bring. It brings people time to dive into who they really are. It seems like a lot of us, well, maybe all of us to some degree, uh, outside of having some of those momentary moments of like, samadhi or enlightenment or breakthrough or, or however you come to that you have a near-death experience or you eat some mushrooms or mm -hmm. ayahuasca or whatever the thing is and you kind of have a moment of, of seeing yourself for the first time it seems and you realize that maybe in that moment you're not as broken as you've always told yourself mm -hmm. that you are and it seems like our thinking mind can be kind of like the foreman of structuring our bodies 
and we grow up in a, in a world that maybe our parents might have not been the best influences or maybe advertisements weren't the best influences or maybe kids at school weren't the best influences. And it puts us into this kind of small, fractured, disconnected version of who we believe ourselves mm -hmm. to be. And then we believe ourselves to be the thoughts. And then that becomes the form that actually is the, the that becomes the, the physical manifestation of our, our tissues. And it seems like what's happening within something like a dispensa situation or even like, like the action of placebo, which is incredibly powerful. And it's amazing that placebo somehow is, is something that we like kick aside. It's like, no, like probably placebo is the thing. And probably uh -huh. this whole thing that we're doing right now is just a big placebo. And if we can tap into that, mm -hmm. that, that part of ourselves that's outside of the thinking mind, it seems like we have a lot more power than maybe what a lot of us, you know, would like to believe because it's kind of scary to believe that you're powerful. Yeah, no, you've described the process. I mean, beautifully, it's, it's exactly what it is. We identify with a story and we identify so much with that story that we fully become that story. And that's why the, the real meditation, if I can call it real, is when you start to observe everything about you, including yourself, like your ideas, what you believe about yourself and realizing that that, entity that you discover after death, like this near-death experience, is none of those. And, um, and to observe all of those traits, like your stories, what you believe you are, your weaknesses, all the things that you have done that maybe you have, you've developed guilt or shame, none of that is you. Mm -mm. You've just, you just feed it. We just feed those, those, that identity. We continue through guilt and remorse and, and, and we, we feed all of this, but none of this is us. And we can discover the true, I think that that's the quest to discover really, uh, you know, our true identity. How did you become so wise with all this stuff and have the, you've really, from my experience of you, you have a really beautiful blend of like wisdom and then also knowing. So like balancing mm -hmm. like East, West kind of, those two worlds, I think it's, it's rare for a person to balance both of those sides very well. What you, what's like, what's going on with you? Um, I mean, my, my most, um, objective answer would be to say, I mean, we'd have to dive a little bit in reincarnation mm. and, uh, you know, when we're born, it's not the first time we're here. So it, it's stuff done before. Uh, I was, I, I think I was born a scientist. And that these kind of thoughts have been there, probably I'm probably born with most of it. Hmm. Uh, and then it, it, it drove me, you know, yeah, it drove me in my life. 